Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. As many of you know, I went to the American Geophysical Union Conference, the AGU, last week in New Orleans. It's a five-day conference. There were over 25,000 scientists attending. Basically, every person that attended the conference could have had a completely different experience at the conference. There were 54 parallel sessions. So, you know, you could you had to choose between one of 54 talks at any given time. Many of the talks were in subcategories that were far away from other ones, so you couldn't shuffle from one session to the other. So the biggest um, challenge I found was narrowing down uh, to uh, specific talks to go and see. So there were four sessions throughout the day. 8 to 10 in the morning, 10.20 to 12.20, 1.40 to 3.40, and 4 to 6. So each of those sessions, four two-hour sessions with 15-minute talks, it's supposed to be 12 minutes with three minutes of questions, but generally it went to almost 15 minutes with uh, very little time for questions. And they, they tried to really keep it on time so people could come in, um, could jump sessions. And then there was a keynote uh, at, at noon, you know, at, at 1230, um, which everybody could attend um, while eating lunch. So a lot of sessions. So, you know, that's four two hour sessions a day. That's 50 minute talks. So that's eight talks per session times four is 32 talks per day times five days, 160 talks plus five keynotes. Plus there were side sessions, side events, and then of course there were posters running in parallel. Hundreds of posters on different topics. And also there was a, there was a fantastic exhibit section with all of the latest technology in drones, use, the use of drones in science, both drones in the, in the air and in the ocean. So underwater autonomous vehicles, in the case of the ocean, Ocean Boys, uh, spectrometers like Picaro had, had devices, new devices to measure uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere like CO2 or nitrous oxide or methane with very high accuracy, um, things like that. So overall, um, you know, it was, it was well worth me going. It was my first AGU conference, like I said. Um, I met and talked to Michael Mann and Stefan Ramsdorf after their talks and also uh, Gavin Smith and uh, Richard Alley and and uh, some of the other big names in uh, climate science um, over the last number of years. Um, James Hansen wasn't there. He was at the Bonn conference, the Bonn climate conference uh, the month earlier. So basically I focused on Arctic talks, on jet stream talks, Greenland and Antarctica, ice melt and dynamics greenhouse gas increases, methane, et cetera. But I also attended a lot of some of the softer sciences, if you like, communication, how, uh, you know, some of the latest science and how to communicate to people better. Um, also climate engineering, solar radiation management, and uh, carbon dioxide removal um, on the last day. There was also a very interesting session on humor in communicating science and Gavin Smith and Richard Alley were, were quite funny in that session. There was also um, the introduction of one of the keynotes, Baba Brinkman, a rapper, um, who was very knowledgeable about climate change, is also a personal friend, um, did a climate rap to introduce the session. I didn't even know he was there. I found out after the fact and uh, we, we didn't cross paths. Um, but uh, we did in Lima, when I went to Lima, to the COP20, and also in Paris for the COP21. So what I want to talk about now is um, one of the most, I think, most significant keynote uh, talks. Um, on, it was on the Monday um, at 12.30 uh, by Dan Rather. Now, I'm sure this talk will be put up on online publicly if it's not already there probably in january i've heard lots of the talks are going to go up then so dan rather is a veteran journalist who's covered national and international stories that have shaped our world including the civil rights movement 
the assassination of President Kennedy, the Vietnam War, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the wars in Afghanistan, Tiananmen Square uprising, 9-11, the US invasion of Iraq, and the Haitian earthquake. With a famed and storied career that has spanned more than six decades, Dan Rather has earned this pla the pla his place as one of the world's best known journalists. He's interviewed every president since Eisenhower and over that time personally covered almost every important dateline in the US and around the world. Um, joined CBS News in 62, you know, was there for many years, was anchor and manager, managing editor of CBS News. He held that post for 24 years. I could go on and on. Um, so he was talking about, uh, he's written a book recently and um, He's uh, president and CEO of, of a new organization he founded uh, called News and Guts, based on um, his Dan Rather reports on HDNet or a follow up to that. So um, he's uh, sort of so definitely one of the world's best known, pro most prolific uh, journalists. So he gave the keynote uh, talk on the Monday, and it was excellent. I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of talk about some of. When some of the things he said and you know how it pertains to climate and how it pertains to today's society and wh where we're heading. So he talked first about science, you know, this is a science conference. So science, the pursuit of knowledge, basically. You know, we see, we hear, we touch, we smell. Um, we, 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 uh, th things across different scales of space and time. Um, there's an awful lot of you know, from, from different, from the microcosm to the macrocosm, um, you know, everything from the chemistry and the physics and the biology and all of the different sciences cover different aspects of, of the physical world. Um, we often uh, do science, it's very important to continue to do science for the sake of knowledge, not just for applications. By applications, it normally means you know, can you make money or can it be weaponized, right? Often that's the way things go with with science, but you know, we can talk about pure science versus applied science, and more and more universities are becoming sponsored by corporations, so they do more, much more applied science and much less uh, pure science. And this is a big problem because serendipity plays a role in in making a lot of the a lot of the major discoveries in science are when people study. A particular thing, def, you know, um, they're, 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 they're looking to study something for a given reason or application and they find something totally different and a uh, major discovery and something totally different that they weren't even looking for. Uh, serendipity plays a big role. You know, science is all about the journey of discovery, you know, our, our wonder, our curiosity, our awe um, regarding this amazing planet that we live on. Humans are basically wired to be interested in science. And we know this from a very young age, children are very, very curious. You know, as soon as a, a baby, you know, starts to get mobile and they're exploring their world, they're pushing their limits, uh, you know, the wonder and curiosity is in every child. And it stays, the people that it stays into the most are the people that end up in with science careers. Um, the U.S. was born in the spirit of science. In fact, modern day society was born in the spirit of science. And rather, Dan Rather has written a, a book on this, which I haven't read yet, but it's on my list. So that's about the science part of it. He talked, of course, about journalists and scientists being similar. There's lots in common. Both, um, both professions um, try to find the truth and both are under siege right now. There's coordinated attacks on both science and journalism from powerful people. The, the degree of these attacks is, is, um, is basically unprecedented because a lot of it is coming from, from the, um, the, the top uh, corridors of, of, of power in, in, in the US. Um, journalists are all about telling stories. You know, people love stories ever since they were sitting around campfires conveying information to each other and knowledge was passed down through through stories and science arguably is the greatest story of all it's the story of life it's the story of how we got to be here and 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 where we're going so right now uh there's tremendous um forces arrayed against science against truth knowledge 
um, and also against the way it's reported and communicated to the press. Um, we, we remember what McCarthyism was and, uh, you know, America, the creation of fake news, propaganda, um, things that are, you know, opinions and not distinguishing opinions from facts. These are all things that are, that are, that are happening, uh, more and more fake news. America can be swept by the dangerous forces of darkness. These are words, these are, these are Rather's own words. Uh, so he's very, very concerned. So, so what's happening? Well, I talked about some of the things that he's covered and he said that 9-11 and Kennedy are seared in his mind. He said that waves of change uh, lap upon us. Um, fake news has always been around, but it's much more uh, dangerous today because of the um, the, the ease in which it can be propagated through society, you know, with social media. Um, it's very important that we sort out facts from the noise and individual people in the public can't do that. This is why we have to rely on scientific opinion to do this. Um, so we need this knowledge when we make decisions. Um, science is the pinnacle of human achievement, if you like, like art and literature. Um, and we, we need this knowledge. So the idea that um, a government can, can actually ban uh, divi groups, div you know, different government branches from saying science-based or facts-based or evidence-based is, is completely ar archaic and Orwellian and is taking us back to the dark ages. Um, and we want to make sure that we don't head off there. So, <sighs> So now, um, so now, so so basically, we're it's a perilous, dangerous time for the U.S. and for the world. Okay, uh, we need science, we need reason, we need knowledge to guide us, or we will succumb to superstition and fear and propaganda, and we can't let that happen. So rather was saying that we need a revolution in how we communicate science. We need storytellers. We have to do a lot better. Uh, we have to confront the biases and confront the propaganda and, 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 and um, treat it as a real threat, which it is. So the, um, the, you know, the press, it, it, the fault of the press is that they're, they're always there for the easy answer, the shallow narratives, the compelling shallow narratives. They really need to do a better job at explaining, you know, what scientists are passionate about and, you know, why they think the way they do and what they think about our future. You know, as for the scientists, many scientists are afraid to talk to journalists because they're worried about being misquoted, they're worried about backlash in their organizations, they're not good storytellers, they might be introverts. Um, so in order to get stories out there, we need the best scientists plus the best storytellers combined. They don't necessarily have to do it separately themselves. And the, the, this, is, this is for writing uh, blogs, this is for writing books, this is for getting, for talks and interviews. We need to act with speed and purpose. We don't have much time on this. We need to tell the story of climate science. We need to um, have this can-do spirit um, and get the world, will the world, you know, listen to scientists. Um, well, we've lost a lot of that. We need to make sure that this world continues to be a world of science and not a world of superstition and not a world of fear and not a world of, of uh, you know, antagonism and no empathy to other, other people in other countries. So it was a very compelling uh, keynote speak. The room was packed full of scientists. You know, many people commented on, on how well Dan Rather presented this and on the dire picture that, that he painted. We are in a perilous, dangerous time um, in the in the U.S. and in the world, and we need to, to we need to deal with this. Thank you.